now we're recording. So check the chat window. I just sent to you uh, the PowerPoint for today for chapter six. I know some of you like to follow along in the PowerPoint. So you can check that chat window. It's not showing up, Ms. Weir. It's not showing oh, up. There it is. There it, Never is. Mind. it arrived. OK, good. Thanks for letting me know. All right. So we're starting out uh, with uh, a little discussion about uh, thermochemistry. And so first, you know, kind of describe, you know, what is what is thermochemistry? And thermochemistry basically is um, has to do with the quantification of heat. Um, the uh, quantification of heat uh, energy. And one thing that I want us to kind of keep in mind is that heat and energy are interchangeable. Now, when we usually talk about the word energy, if we were in a physics class, we would begin the talk with, you know, what is energy? And it's basically the capacity to do work. And then don't you love a definition inside of another definition? What we mean by work is, um, you know, force multiplied by distance. And so you'll hear us say that a system does work. Okay, a system does work. We'll be using, you know, phrases like that, but we'll say that a system um, does work. Now, when we talk about uh, types of energy, of course, there are different types of energy and your book uh, talks a little bit about like uh, radiant energy. I guess I can call this types of, you know, types of energy. They talk about radiant energy and of course versus like thermal energy, but basically radiant energy comes from uh, the sun. That's the same thing as solar energy. Okay, it comes from the sun. And whereas uh, thermal energy, this is associated with the random motion of molecules and atoms. So the more thermal energy that molecules and atoms possess, uh, the faster they move. Now that is um, not the same thing as temperature. Not the same thing as temperature. Temperature is related to heat, but it's not the same thing as heat. Um, oh my goodness, I lied to you up here, guys. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, thermodynamics is not so much the quantification of energy, it's um, the study of energy. It's the study of energy and its conversions. This is something else. This is something else. <clears throat> so back to this idea of temperature. Temperature is, um, this is a measurement of heat intensity. And the best way I can kind of describe this, you know, temperature versus heat um, is I'm going to talk a little bit about something called specific heat capacity. Okay. 
And all objects have a specific heat capacity. And what the specific heat capacity of an object is, the amount of energy that that material can absorb and it increases the temperature uh, of, okay, to increase the temperature of one gram by one degree Celsius. So, so the specific heat capacity of something is the amount of energy required to heat one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And I'll give you an example. The heat capacity of water, which is a number that you should know, and I'm being lazy here, it's the specific heat capacity of water, is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's a weird looking unit, but it's joules per gram degree Celsius. <coughs> so what that means is that if you want to heat one gram of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 21 degrees Celsius, you must apply 4.184 joules of energy. Or we can say the water must absorb 4.184 joules of energy. Okay, so I like to write it out so that you can kind of process it that way, because this idea of heat and temperature, a lot of times we kind of think of them as the same thing, and they're really not. Temperature has to do with energy, or heat has to do with energy, and temperature is a, a way that you measure that heat intensity. And so a good way to kind of understand or explain the difference between temperature and energy is to go through this definition of specific heat. So the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. This is a number again that you should memorize. And what that means is if you had one gram of water and you wanted to raise the temperature from 20 to 21 degrees Celsius, then that one gram of water has to absorb 4.184 joules of energy. So this kind of uh, leads us back to our the beginning of our discussion, uh, what are the most common units of energy? What are some quanti uh, common units for quantifying energy? Well, one of the most common units is the joule which is just capital J, J-O-U-L-E, the joule. Um, there's another common unit, and that is the calorie. Now, both the joule and the calorie are based on definitions of water, but uh, a calorie with the little c, that's the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Most of the times we talk within kilojoules or kilocalories. So you can have kilocalories and that's often K -C -O -O, K -C -A -L or capital C-A-L. So food calories, for example, 
are often measured in kilocalories. If you look at the back of a food label, um, you'll see that it'll tell you that something is worth, um, let's say 100 calories, but you'll often see it 100 CAL, capital CAL, and that's really 100,000 calories with a little c. So you kind of have to pay attention when you're looking at the word calorie. Is it calorie with a little c or a calorie with a big c? Me, when I write it out, I'll write it out this way, K-C-A-L. So there's no confusion in my handwriting between a capital C and a lowercase c. Now there is a relationship between joules and calories. And that's why I wanted to introduce the idea of uh, of uh, specific heat, uh, one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules of energy. That's an important conversion factor. And that's calorie with a little c. So one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. I'm skipping ahead here. Those of you that are following along, um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit to um, page 246. I'm skipping ahead to page 246. And if you're following on the PowerPoint, um, I'm skipping ahead to Um, to slide number eight. I'm skipping ahead to slide number eight. <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit about calorimetry. Calorimetry, this is the quantification of heat. When I was giving you a definition earlier, I gave it to you in the wrong place. This is uh, the quantification of heat energy is calorimetry. And so the device that we use in order to figure out um, how to quantify heat the device that we use is called a calorimeter. And there are different kinds of calorimeter. There's what we call a constant volume calorimetry, and then there's constant pressure calorimetry. So there's constant volume and then there's constant pressure calorimity or calorimeters. So two different types of devices. So I'm gonna show you a quick um, diagram from your book. This is on page 247 or if you're following along in the slideshow, this is slide number 10. Um, it's a diagram of a constant volume calorimeter. Sometimes it's referred to as a bomb calorimeter. Kind of a cool name. So to give you an idea of how calorimeters work. <clears throat> okay, so on your screen is a picture of a bomb calorimeter. Again, this is from page 247. And so what they've done is they've cut one of these devices 
in half so that you can see inside. So this is basically like a big metal box. And inside of this metal box, there's a chamber, which inside of the chamber, there's another little uh, chamber. And inside of this smaller chamber, you have a sample. And now that sample could be um, some sort of a powder. It could be, it's usually something that's powdery. It's hard to set a solid on fire, but you could put like a potato chip in there. Um, but usually it's probably like some small sample. And then in the sample, they have two wires that are coming into here because those are going to be ignition wires. Those wires are basically going to create a spark that will set the sample on fire. And so the fire or the uh, sample that we're going to set on fire is inside this small little metal container that has a lid on it. Now, inside this container, they do have um, some oxygen in there so that the sample will burn. And so this part right here, this inner chamber where the sample is, that's what's referred to affectionately as the bomb. Now outside of the bomb, the bomb is covered with water. So this container here is sealed and then it's covered with water because once you set this on fire, the sample, as the fire burns, the heat that the fire puts off is going to be transferred to the water. So the way we're gonna quantify the heat that's being given off by the burning sample is we're going to measure the temperature change of the water. We're gonna measure the temperature change of the water. And you'll see that there's a stirrer here and the stirrer is going to be stirring the water to ensure even mixing of the heating of the water as the heat is given off. The reason it's called constant volume is because the chamber in which the sample exists doesn't change size. So um, you know that gases, whatever gas is in here is gonna expand. And basically this sealed chamber is not gonna let that gas expand. The gas is gonna stay whatever the size of the bomb or the inner chamber is. So <coughs> one way, one type of device that we can use to um, quantify heat. In calorimetry, we basically set stuff on fire and then we look to see how the heat generated by whatever's on fire is uh, being given off, heating up a water sample. Another style of a calorimeter, and this is slide number 12, another style of a calorimeter, this is a constant pressure calorimeter. So again, if you're following in your book, this is uh, on page 249 of your textbook. This is an example of a constant pressure calorimeter. And the reason we call it constant pressure is because we usually do this at room temperature or at room pressure. And so whatever pressure of the room is, uh, that is the pressure that we're going to be doing our, um, excuse me, our experiment at. And a constant or a uh, coffee cup calorimeter, it gets its name because of what we can build it out of. Um, literally styrofoam coffee cups. So like if you were to go to a convenience store and buy some hot chocolate or buy a cup of coffee, you could get two of those styrofoam cups and something to serve as a lid and you can build a calorimeter. For constant pressure calorimeters, at least the one that's shown in your diagram, we don't have to set something on fire. Instead, we can mix chemicals in the presence of water. So let me show you how this one's built. You have two styrofoam cups, one nested inside of each other. And in the cup, you have a known amount of water. So you add to the water, most commonly, you add a mixture of two chemicals, like an acid in a base. That becomes your reaction mixture. So as the acid and base are reacting, they're gonna heat up the water <clears throat> that they're mixed in. And again, you have a stir here to, share, to ensure even mixing of the heat that's being given off. The reaction mixture, as the acid and the base react, they're going to heat up the water and you can measure the temperature change using the thermometer. The idea is that this lid right here um, traps and prevents any heat from leaving the water and the two styrofoam cups ideally perfectly insulate so that you don't lose any heat 
to the outside environment. And so this is a common way if we were meeting on campus, we would be doing coffee cup calorimetry and which is what one of our labs will have us do as a coffee cup style calorimetry where we'll mix a, a little bit of chemicals to kind of figure out what is what we call the heat of the reaction. So let me kind of back up here and go towards the beginning. What am I talking about when I say the heat of a reaction? I had planned my lecture one way and I'm ending up delivering it in a different way. So while I've got this out, <clears throat> this is number three. So let me talk about, um, you know, the heat and chemical reactions. Well, there are types of chemical reactions that give off heat. What we call exothermic reactions. These basically give off heat. Now, the way a chemist would describe it is a chemist would say the exothermic reactions, instead, what they do is that they lose heat to the environment. Oops, they lose heat to their environment versus the opposite of that endothermic reactions. These, in a sense, they absorb heat. What a chemist would say is that they remove heat from the environment. Oops, I misspelled environment there, environment. There we go. So endothermic reactions, they give off heat, whereas <clears throat> endothermic reactions absorb heat, or I think I said that backwards, exothermic reactions, they give off heat, whereas endothermic reactions, they absorb heat. So what are we looking at? Well, let's say you have a system. And a system could be like a chemical reaction. A system could be a chemical reaction. When we observe a chemical reaction, you and I are not part of the system. We are part of out here, the surroundings. Or we might call this the environment. The universe is both the system and the surroundings. So together, the system and the surroundings comprise the universe. So when we look or when we observe a chemical reaction, let's say we're observing a very basic chemical reaction, like a simple acid-base reaction. We just have a little bit of hydrochloric acid reacting with a little bit of sodium hydroxide. And you know from previous lectures that this is gonna generate a salt and water, but also it will generate some heat. The system is the actual chemical reaction itself. This is the system. You and I are not actually part of the chemical reaction. We are observers. Okay, we're the ones that are watching the reaction happen and we experience the heat change. So this is what's happening. The system is in here. Um, let me get another colored pen.
<clears throat> excuse me. So the system in my diagram would be in here. Okay. And what we would see is that the system is generating heat, but we would experience up here by an increase in temperature. So we would say that this system, it's generating heat, or we could say it's giving off heat, or it loses it to the environment. When heat is a product of the environment, okay, when heat is a product, then you have an exothermic reaction. You have an exothermic reaction. When we quantify changes in heat, when we quantify changes in heat, we would say that the delta H of this system is negative. So let's say that we measured the change and we quantified it, and it turned out to be something like uh, 21 joules. We would say that the amount of energy generated is actually negative 21 joules. But in this case, the negative sign does not mean below zero, like negative 21. What the minus sign is indicating is that the system lost energy, that the system lost energy, versus if we had a different chemical reaction that was endothermic, um, let me find an example of an endothermic reaction real quick. Um, I wanted to write one out for you. Versus if we had an example of something that was endothermic, if we had something that said plus 21 joules of energy, then the plus sign would indicate that the system gained energy. Well, there's a law in the universe that says the amount of energy in the universe is constant. Okay, there's a law that says the amount of energy in the universe is constant. So if one of these gains energy, it's because the other has lost energy. Vice versa, if one of these loses energy, then it's transferred to the other. So in thermodynamics, we understand that if there is a gain of energy in the environment, if we see heat, it's because that heat came from the system. So a gain in the environment, in viro, is due to a loss in the system. Oh, there's an in there. The gain in the environment is due to a loss in the system. And because you and I are part of the system, we experience an increase in temperature or we experience what we see as heat gain because the system lost the heat. So when we quantify things in thermodynamics, we quantify them from the perspective of the system. We don't quantify them from the perspective of the environment. We have to tell if the environment is losing or gaining energy, and we do that with a plus or a negative sign. So if we have an answer where the change in energy is positive, that means that the energy or that the system had an energy gain. What we experience is a decrease in temperature because we are part of the environment. 
And the opposite is true. If we see an increase in heat in the environment, that's because the system has lost energy. And so what we have observed is an increase in temperature in the environment. Okay. So let's do a little bit of math. Well, before we do some math, let me write out uh, a couple of things for you. So the way we can kind of uh, note this through some notations is we have delta H is equal to the H of the products minus the H of the reactants. Okay. Some notation here. <clears throat> what does delta H mean? Delta H refers to the enthalpy of a system. Delta A, or <clears throat> to the enthalpy of the system. And enthalpy sometimes is referred to as the heat of a reaction. We can kind of diagram if the enthalpy change is going to be positive or negative. So a positive change is an endothermic reaction. Whereas a negative change is an exothermic reaction. We can do a general diagram of the difference between uh, the amount of energy in the products as compared to the amount of energy in the reactants. This is uh, over time. And this is the amount of energy that we have in a system. Let's say you have some level of energy in your products that looks like this, okay? This is your products. And as the energy proceeds, down here, this is the level of your reactants. This distance right here, this is the amount of energy released because your products have more energy than what your reactants do. Those of you that are in biology, this looks a whole lot like a catalytic reaction. So a good example of something like this would be like aerobic respiration where you'd have glucose and when you burn glucose, you end up with carbon dioxide and water but the amount of energy released here is approximately 36 ATP. If we were in a biochemistry class, that's how we would define it. Okay. That's how, those would be the words that we use to talk about it. Because ATP is another way that we can measure energy. But if we're not in a biology class, then we can say this is the amount of energy released. It still ends up being an exothermic reaction. This is what an exothermic reaction diagrams looks like is that the products end up having more than what the reactants do and so you end up with a negative delta H or a negative enthalpy of the reaction. Whereas if you compare that to an endothermic reaction, a okay, same diagram, energy over time, here are your products and here are your reactants. Okay, there's some energy level here, 
So you have E1, just calling that energy one, energy two. If your products have less energy than your reactants, then this change in energy here is the amount of energy absorbed. And again, those of you in biology, this would be a good example of the opposite of aerobic respiration. which is photosynthesis, where you have carbon dioxide and water coming together to form carbohydrates. So when your graph looks like this, uphill in a sense, this is the amount of energy absorbed by the system, or you have a positive enthalpy change, a positive heat of reaction. Okay. So I'm gonna pause here for just a second. I have a short video to share with you. It's about five minutes long, but I wanted to get through this part, um, just kind of talking about you know enthalpy in a system and this idea of endothermic versus exothermic. But I wanted to share this video with you and he explains the same thing in a slightly different way. <clears throat> So if you would please, oh, this is the wrong one. Hold on, let me try this again. Where'd my video go? I put the link to this video in Blackboard. So if you want to watch this video again, you can. So if you were to ask somebody to think about a chemical reaction, right? Okay. All right. Now I've got it going. Tell me yes or no out loud. Do you see the video? Yes. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. So if you were to ask somebody to think about a chemical reaction, or you yourself were to think about a chemical reaction, you'd probably come up with uh, an explosion or maybe even the production of fire. Didn't know I could do that. A anyway, we understand that in some chemical reactions, there's an output of energy, either in the form of heat or light. And if we think about it, we could also understand that there are some processes that require an input of energy. I mean, think about uh, ice melting, for example. It requires that energy be input in order to change from one state to another. So within chemical changes and even physical changes, we understand that there's energy involved. Now, the study of this energy, at least as it relates to chemical reactions or chemical processes, is what we call thermochemistry. But just where does this energy come from? So what I have here are two magnets. Now, if we think about a chemical bond, as a chemical bond is being broken, much like these magnets, it takes energy to overcome the attractive forces. And when new bonds form, we can hear that energy is released as a result of these two forces coming together, or these two substances coming together in forming that bond. So if we think about this as an analogy to a chemical bond, it takes energy to break chemical bonds and energy is released when bonds form. Now there's gonna be a discrepancy or a difference in these two values and whatever that is, is ultimately gonna result in a net release of energy to the surroundings or a net requirement of energy from the surroundings. And if there's a net release of energy to the surroundings, especially if it's a large amount, we're going to get heat and light being produced. And this type of reaction is something that we call an exothermic reaction. Think about things exiting or leaving. So in this case, we're talking about energy or heat being lost to the surroundings. And we sometimes see that in the form of heat or light. But in the reverse process of that, let's say that there's a net energy being absorbed to that particular chemical system or that process. In that case, we have an overall energy input from the surroundings into that chemical reaction or that process. And we say that that is endothermic. So we have two types of reactions that we can talk about when we look at thermochemistry. Again, we have exothermic reactions where there's a net release of energy to the surroundings, and we have endothermic processes where there is a net absorption or taking in of energy from its surroundings.
So just as we use balanced chemical equations to represent how and what reactants form what products and in what ratios, we're now going to include energy or heat into these balanced chemical equations as something called thermochemical equations. And there's a few ways that we can represent this. The first is to include our energy within the chemical equation itself. So for an endothermic process where energy is put in, we see this energy included on the reactant side. For an exothermic reaction in which energy is going to be released or produced as a result of this chemical reaction, we're going to see it on the product side. There's also another way when we start to quantify this, we can remove it and treat it as something that we call enthalpy. Now, enthalpy is a little bit challenging to explain, but ultimately for our purposes in introductory chemistry, it's effectively the heat or energy that's required or the heat or the energy that's released as a result of a chemical process. So there is no zero value, but what we can measure is the change in the overall enthalpy by figuring out how much heat is lost or gained. So when we go to include this in a thermochemical equation, those that are exothermic see a net loss of enthalpy because they are losing energy or heat to the surroundings. And as a result, we see this delta H as a negative sign. Whereas for an endothermic reaction, energy or heat is put into the system, and as a result, it's gained. And so we see that it has a positive value when we put its delta H into that equation. Now, there is another way that we can represent what goes on in a thermochemical process, and that's using something called an enthalpy diagram. And in this enthalpy diagram, as I indicated, there's no zero value. It's just a relative measure of enthalpy of reactants and products. And if we take a look at an endothermic process, we can see that since energy is input into this particular system, that the reactants are gonna have lower enthalpy than the products are. And ultimately we can put in an increase in the overall enthalpy of this particular reaction. Whereas for exothermic reactions, we can see that since energy is going to be lost or given off to the surroundings, ultimately what we have are reactants that have a higher overall enthalpy than the products. And we can see that over the course of this reaction, we can equate it to having a loss of enthalpy as this reaction proceeds. Now, these seem a little vague in terms of the amount of energy that's gonna be released or absorbed. I mean, wouldn't it be beneficial in a chemical reaction to know just how much energy is gonna be produced or just how much energy might be required? Well, yeah, I mean, those are kind of rhetorical questions, aren't they? There's gotta be some way that we can establish values or quantify the amount of energy that's lost or gained in a chemical process so that we can include those in our thermochemical equations and enthalpy diagrams. So stay tuned for how we figure that out. Thanks for watching. So if you were to ask. All right. All right, cool. I like this guy. I like that he wears a purple shirt. So we're going to do some calculations. Um, I'm not sure we'll get to the quantifying chemical reactions today. That might be where we pick up on Wednesday. But I wanted to do some sample calculations with you using um, this idea of calorimetry, and that way we can quantify heat a little bit better, make our discussion um, a little more concrete in our brains. So here is a sample calculation. This is similar, but not exactly very similar to those of you that are in your textbook to page 247, very similar to page 247. I don't think I have a sample problem in your PowerPoint. Yeah, but this is similar to page 247. <clears throat> so we have a sample of water that's being heated from 15 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. And we need to calculate the amount of heat that is absorbed by the water. So uh, <clears throat> how would we do this? Well, there's an equation that looks like this. Heat is equal to the specific heat of the substance, which is often abbreviated by C, times the mass of the substance, times the temperature change. So in this equation, C is, stands for the specific heat of the substance. And 
and mass is going to be the mass of whatever substance that you're talking about. With the exception of water, you'll have to consult a table to look up the specific heat of a substance. There is a small table on page uh, 246 or on slide number, what slide number is this? Slide number six. those of you that are using the PowerPoint, but there is a table that you can look at um, to find some specific heats. Now for specific heats of elements, um, some of your periodic tables will also list specific heats. You might have to look on the reverse of your periodic table, and um, but you'll find that a lot of your periodic tables also contain the specific heats of the elements. You'd have to consult a table and you can Google it even to look up the specific heat of things like wood or even glass. But if you need to know just the specific heat of an element, a lot of times that will be on your periodic tables. Now water, of course, is not an element, but you should know the specific heat of water. But since this is our first day, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. We're going to solve this by the specific heat of water is 4.184, remember, joules per gram degree Celsius, times the mass of the water. And this is nice because it's in grams for us. If the water was not given in grams, we would have to convert it to grams because our specific heat units are in grams. So this. If this is in grams, then the mass should be in grams. Be careful when you look at other tables, like if you're Googling things online, if this is in kilograms, or if this is in calories, or if this is in kelvins, that you'll need to pay attention to that because it can impact the units of your answer. Uh, times the temperature change, and my temperature change is gonna be 25 degrees Celsius minus 15 degrees Celsius. So when I do this math, and I don't have my calculator. Oh, here it is. I get a huge number. That's what my calculator spits out at me. Did you get the same number? So I got the same number. Same number, good, good. So yes, Vikram got the same number. So here's my question for you. What are the units? Joule. Very good. Grams and grams cancel. Degrees Celsius and degrees Celsius cancel, leaving me with joules. And then also heat is quantified in either joules or calories. And I don't have any calories, so this is in joules. What if you were asked to report your answer in kilojoules. Well, the conversion the word kilo means 1000, correct? 1000 joules into 1 kilojoule. So your answer would be what? You can tell me out loud or you can type it in. Did you get 20.92? Some of you are typing it in, direct messaging that to me. Thank you. 
So when you're solving these, look to see if they ask you to report your answer in a certain unit. And just so that we can practice our conversions, let's say you had to report your answer in calories with a little c. Well, if you had to report your answer in calories, you would need 20, 9, 20 joules. Do you remember what the conversion is? Joules to calories? Tell me out loud if you do. I'll give you a hint. It's based on the specific Isn't heat of water. It's the same as uh, the specific heat, so it's 4.184. Very good. 4.184 joules per calorie. So that would equal 5,000 calories. And just for funsies, if you had to report your answer in kilocalories, then it would be 5,000 calories is equal to 5KCAL. Remember, I'll always write KCL when I'm doing my handwriting so that you don't confuse my little C's with capital C's. So all of these answers, oops, they are all equivalent to each other. They're all the same number. Let's try another example. Type a number one in the chat window when I can uh, change pages for me, please. Good, good, okay. So going on to the next example, this is similar to the water example. Okay. A, um, let's see here. Let's see. The specific heat of aluminum is, and I got this from the periodic table, the specific heat of aluminum is 0.89 joules per gram degree Celsius. How much energy is required to heat a um, 15 gram sample of aluminum from 20 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. Okay. So the specific heat of aluminum is 0.89 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And again, if you're wondering um, where I got that number, this is from a data table. It could be your periodic table. How much energy is required to heat a 15 gram sample of aluminum from 20 to 35 degrees Celsius? And I want you to report your answer in kilojoules. And I want you to report your answer 
in calories. So try that for me. Miss Weir, are you on mute? I am, but I'm not talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just solving the problem. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, those of you that are in the process of solving the problem, or if you finish the problem, you can check your answers against mine. Um, what was I doing here? So just practicing um, with this equation. 
How did I do? Did I get the answers right? Yes, we have a question. Yes, go ahead. So whenever it's going from 20 degrees Celsius to 35, do we flip that on the equation? So like on top, it went 20 to 35, and on the bottom is 35 to 20. Uh, yeah, because it's the temperature change. Oh, okay. Because this is, temperature change is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. That's why. So good, good. All right, the last thing I want to leave you with is in uh, your Chem 101, the last thing I want to leave you with is a short little in-class assignment. There's no points associated with this, so it's not like if you get something wrong, uh, you won't be uh, punished. But I have a little quiz for you. Where did it go? I have a little quiz for you. So if you are in Chem 101, let me launch this real quick. Well, I think I put it in the wrong class. I did. Okay, so in Chem 101, oh, I put it in the lab. What's wrong with me? It's like I don't know how to work my computer today. Okay, so in Chem 101, you should see an assignment that says uh, in-class assignment, in-class activity, and it has today's date on it. And it's called thermochemistry. All right, there we go. So in Chem 101, if you wanna practice a little bit, um, I don't think there's any math problems, but in Chem 101, you should see um, a little activity called thermochemistry and it has today's date on it. And there are 10 problems. And so you can kind of practice answering some questions about thermochemistry there. When I see you on Wednesday, we'll pick up uh, where we left off and what we'll talk about on Wednesday is we'll practice calculations similar to the ones um, on page. We'll do, we'll practice some uh, enthalpy and calorimetry. for identifying metals. And then we'll practice um, quantifying
the heat of a reaction. We'll practice those two things on Wednesday. Do you have any questions for me? Are, are we going to uh, have the 3.8 quiz and the chapter 5 oh, quiz? Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Check your email for oops, uh, chapter 3.8 quiz and chapter 5 quiz. And the deadline for those is going to be very generous. And almost forgotten about them. Um, today's the fifth. I'm going to put the deadline for those April 26th. They're going to be short quizzes, but I'll put the deadline April 26th on those. <clears throat> In fact, that is going to be our deadline for pretty much everything um, from now to the end of the semester is April 26th. We only have five weeks of school left. Can you believe it? Only five weeks left of this challenging school year doing everything remotely. Are, are they going to go back to classrooms this summer? I am not sure, Bob, if they're going to go this summer, I know the plan is to go back in the fall for sure. Yeah. Unless, of course, something changes. Right. But for summer classes, I'm not sure. I think they're still discussing it, the logistics of it, um, as to how that will happen. So I don't know. Since I don't teach summer school, I don't, I haven't really paid attention to those conversations. <laughs> if I'm 100% completely honest. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who cares? It doesn't impact me. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, will we be doing the week 10 lab quiz still? Um, let me check. I'm still in a little bit of a fog, so let me check. I do have some of you for lab this afternoon. So I'll check between now and uh, maybe we'll just do week 10 lab together in lab today. That way you don't have to worry about another assignment on your own. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, I gotta log off to get ready for my next lecture. But practice uh, the uh, Chem 101 uh, activity when we log off, it'll still be available for about 12 hours. It's not for a grade. It's just something for you to practice. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you so much. And I'll be answering your emails today. Uh, Mrs. Weir? Um, yes. I'm sorry. The week 10 lab is at Hess's Law Lab, right? Um, I don't remember. What were we doing last week or is it this week? Oh, what are we doing today? Oh, yes, so for lab, are we doing what we were supposed to be doing last week or are we doing this week's? Let me double check real quick. Okay. Because we missed lab last week and last week's was Hess's law, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're going to do Hess's law today and Thursday. Okay, sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I will see you guys in lab and the rest of you I will see on Wednesday.